Throughout the history of mankind, man's arrogance and his pride have led to the false assumption, and I say false, that I know that that will never happen here. And perhaps some of us in this audience today may have made that statement, that I know this will never happen. But you know, that is not true. In Proverbs, the 27th chapter, there in verse 1, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 3 and 4, Peter uh, warned, Knowing this first, that there shall come scoffers, walking after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. There again is the problem why they, the enemies of Christ during his time were saying to the apostles, where is the coming? Why everything's been the same way it's been all the way back to the creation. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Why should we expect anything different than what has happened for centuries of time. Paul condemned this attitude also in 1 Thessalonians 5 and in verse 3. And there he says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Again, people were saying, well, peace and safety, things are, are going along like they've always gone. And he says, beware, because when you get to that point is when it's going to happen. That's true for men over the years. Back in 1937, Japan was at war with China. On September the 1st, 1939, the Germans invaded Poland. In 1941, Germany and its allies attacked the Soviet Union. And there were some in America who were saying, that will never happen here. That's over in Europe. Let them take care of it. That will never happen uh, in our America. But on December the 7th, 1941, at 7.55 in the morning, Japan joined Germany and attacked the U.S. at Pearl Harbor. And 3,500 Americans died. And the U.S. entered into World War II. But again, there were some who said, well, that was an isolated island over in the Pacific. That will never happen on U.S. soil in America. But on September the 11th, 2001, not one, but four attacks occurred in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Those four attacks killed almost as many people within a few hundred of those that were killed on Pearl Harbor. In the seventh century, a man named Mohammed started the religion of Islam in the East, and now it has 1.5 billion followers and is now the second largest religion in Europe. And there's some who say, oh, that will never happen in the United States or in our country. And yet the truth of the matter is that there are now 7 million members of the Muslim faith in the United States. Not only are there seven million members, there are special rooms that are provided now in our schools. There are special rooms in businesses for Muslim prayers. We are now teaching Arab, the Arabic language in our public schools. Muslims dress is per permitted in, in the workplace. And it's estimated that there are 100,000 Muslim polygamy, polygamous marriages in our country now. Sharia law, which is the law of the Koran or the Muslim faith, 
Sharia law is now has compliant instruments in companies that produce financial documents for use by Muslims. Such companies as Citibank, Merrill Lynch, Dow Jones, all of these have Muslim compliant financial documents uh, lending their uh, support to the Muslim faith. Muslim dress is permitted in the workplace. This Sharia law is found as the law, not um, uh, American law, but Sharia law, is now found in what is called Sharia law conclaves. These are isolated communities that are made up of hundreds or, or more of the Muslim faith. And those Muslim compliant concaves are found in states like Minnesota, they're in Dearborn, Michigan, Baltimore, Maryland, and even uh, Islamburg, New York. And not to be left out, they are found in Little Rock, Arkansas. That will never happen in America was just not true. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, verses 1 through 3, Jesus told the apostles that the temple that they were so proud of all the rebuilt facilities in Jerusalem. He said, these are going to be torn down and destroyed. There will not be one stone left upon another stone. And the apostles were amazed. In fact, later on, they took him aside privately. And they said to our Lord, you know, when are these things going to happen? In the back of their mind, this can't happen again. We've rebuilt the temple. We've rebuilt the walls. The gates are now in place. We are secured. And yet you're telling us that all of this is going to be destroyed. It was almost as if they were saying, this cannot happen again. And yet in AD 70, Titus with three legions of Roman soldiers attacked Jerusalem surrounded the city and starved the people out and destroyed the temple, the walls, and the entire uh, facilities of that great city. This will never happen here. America was founded upon the belief in God as creator of the universe, the Christian principles found in the Bible. And for over 200 years, we have experienced and expected the this to continue as it is. Anything different from that, many will say, will never happen here. But now evolution is taught in every public school. There are strong attempts to remove the name of God from classrooms, to remove the name of God from courthouses, from our own currency, from the Pledge of Allegiance, and other documents and activities that recognize God. There are laws now in many states that desecrate God's laws on marriage and statutes and ordinances protecting and promoting homosexuality. Uh, 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 these abound almost in every place. And even here in our little city of Atlantic Beach. In fact, there have been two public hearings on the adoption of an ordinance that would protect homosexuality in the city of Atlantic Beach. Many are still saying, that will never happen here. In fact, at the last meeting, there was a man, a man who stood up and made the statement, let's leave God out of this. That which will never happen here, my friends, has happened. And the question is, what will we do about it? Edmund Burke, an English philosopher, penned these words, all that is required for evil to prevail is for good men and women to do nothing. My friends, we can say that this will never happen in America, but it is happening, and we must stand up and speak up against it. But to bring it a little bit closer to home, have you ever had your mind so made up 
that you could not imagine a certain thing happening to you personally. As you look at the Bible, that very thing happened to Simon Peter. You'll recall that over in Luke, the 22nd chapter in verse 31, the Lord had a very personal conversation with Simon Peter. And beginning in verse 31 of Luke 22, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou, hast, uh, thou shalt uh, thrice deny that thou knowest me. What was Peter actually saying to the Lord? This is not going to happen to me, Lord. You got to be wrong. This is not going to happen to me. And yet Jesus says that it will. There are some very important lessons, I believe, that we can learn from this experience of Simon Peter. The first of them being that God limits the power of Satan. Satan does not have the power to do anything that he chooses with Christians or any others here on this earth. You'll recall in the passage we just read in verse 31 that Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have thee that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Simon, Satan wants you. Simon, uh, Satan desires you, but I have prayed that you will fail not. The same thing occurred over in Job's life in Job 1 in verse 12. God, you'll remember, had a conversation with Satan about a man named Job. And, be, and it says that behold all that he hath conversation with Satan. Behold, all that he hath is in thy power only upon himself. Put not forth thy hand. Job 2, 4 through 6. Everything is in thy hand, but put not thy hand against him. And of course, Satan did exactly that. Satan took every possession that he had, every family member that he had, took all of that away, but he did not touch Job. But Satan didn't give up. Satan came back. You recall that he came back and Satan said to, to God, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Behold, Jesus, or God says, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Satan says, God, you, 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 you've got it wrong here. We've taken all of his possessions away, but you really haven't touched him. If you touch him, he, like everyone else, is skin for skin. He would give anything for his life. You touch him personally, and he will not only deny, but he'll curse you. And God says, Satan, you afflict him, but you're not going to take his life. There ought to be some comfort in that to us, that tra tra trials and tribulations will come to us. But God is not going to give Satan free reign in your life or in mine. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, Paul uh, comforts us with these words. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. My friends, don't think that Satan has uh, total control over your life. Paul says that's not true. There is no temptation that has overtaken you, that there is not a way of escape. Satan is limited as to what he can do in your life and in mine, unless 
you and I give him that power and that strength. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 3, Paul again says, But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. God will limit what Satan can do in your life uh, and in mine. Again, when it comes to this matter of temptation, James, over in James, the first chapter, verse 13, James says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James is saying that when we fail, it is because we have given in to Satan. But there's some more important lessons that we can learn uh, from Peter's uh, experience. Peter had boasted of his loyalty to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I, I believe that he really meant that. I believe that he really thought, this will never happen to me. Lord, I've been with you for three years. I, I've been an apostle. I, I've stood up for you, and you're telling me I'm going to deny. That will never happen to me. But there is no real way to know until there is the sifting of the wheat from the chaff. Our loyalty to our Lord, in whatever case it may be, must be tested before we know that we are true. In James, the first chapter, verses two through four, James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lack, lacking nothing. You know, that's an interesting statement he makes at the end of that passage, that that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When does that come? James says it comes when we fall into trials and temptations. We may say it'll never happen to me, but how do you know? James says you don't know that until trials and temptations come. Then you are mature or perfect and complete in the Lord Jesus lacking nothing. Not only did Peter believe that his betrayal of our Lord would never happen, but get this, in Matthew 16, verses 21 through 22, Jesus was telling his apostles, we're going into Jerusalem, I'm going to be persecuted, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die on the cross. And in Matthew 16, 21 and 22, Peter took Jesus aside and listen to what he said. God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Not only did Peter think it couldn't happen to him, he takes the Lord aside and the Bible says he rebuked him and said, God forbid, this will never happen to you. But once again, Peter got it all wrong. And it did happen. What he said would never happen. There's another lesson we can learn from Peter. And that is that failing the test is always a bitter experience. Peter said, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. In Mark 14, 29. And even though all shall be offended, yet will I not. But over in Mark's account, he says, Jesus says, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And, G and uh, Peter, again in verse 14, 31, comes back, and he spake more vehemently, Even if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me this very day. 
And Peter comes back and, and the word is there vehemently, angrily, upset, disturbed. Lord, I will die with you. And I believe that he meant it. But he just was uninformed. He just did not know what was before him. It's never easy. Never is it easy to be told we are not what we think we are. Never is it easy to eat crow and say, you know, I, I was wrong. I, I really didn't realize this or that. And you know, it's interesting to me that only Luke uh, records the, uh, the incident in, in uh, the way that he does. And that is in verse 54 of Luke 22. And it says that then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. And he denied him saying, woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, after another confidentially uh, affirming, saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him. And he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he set, yet spake, the cock crew. Now listen to verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the words of the Lord. How he said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Luke is the only one that talks about the look that Jesus gave to Peter. What a look it must have been. It could have been a look that said, Peter, I told you, but you said it wouldn't happen to you. It was a look that brought Peter to remember the words of our Lord. And it says, Luke says, that he wept bitterly. Not just did he weep, but he wept bitterly. It is never easy when we find out that we really are not what we thought that we were. And Luke says that Peter remembered what the Lord had said. When we fall in serving the Lord, the answer is the same answer that we see in Peter. Because it says that when, G, when he saw the look of Jesus, he remembered. Anytime we as Christians in our time fail, the road back from that failure is to remember where we were before we fell. In Revelation, the second chapter in verse 5, John says to the church at Ephesus, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Do the first works, or else I come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except you repent. When the church at Ephesus departed from the faith, John said by inspiration, you remember from whence you are fallen. You remember what you've done, what you've said, what you've committed to your Lord. And that's the first step in overcoming failure in our lives. The Bible does not say if you sin. The Bible says that when you sin. In Romans, the third chapter, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In order to get ourselves back to where we were, we must remember from whence we are fallen. There was a time in our lives when we made a commitment, I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to change the way that I'm living. I'm repenting of that. I'm turning away from it. And we must remember the day that commitment was made.
to our Lord. We all, I think, at times in our lives would like to forget some things. But even if we put them out of our memory, they are not forgiven. We may ease our conscience by just saying, I'm not even going to think about that. But that does not forgive those sins. The lesson, I think, the bottom line that we learn from Peter is that we must not give up. We must not be so arrogant and proud that we say to ourselves, that could never happen to me. In fact, I, I've heard people make the statement, well, I would never do what they've done. What a foolish statement to make. How do you know unless you've been tried and tested in the same way? Oh, that'll never happen to me. Is a very foolish statement to make. But in closing, I guess the question is, why do we fail? Why do we allow things that we say would never happen to happen to us? Jesus gave us the answer to that in the parable of the sower over in Matthew 13. You remember there he pictured the sower and the seeds. And in one of the cases he says that the seed fell by the wayside. Satan pulls us back into our life that we had before. And if we don't remember that, uh, he will get us for sure. Then also he said that there were some who fell by stone, on the stony ground at tribulations and persecution. It just got too tough. And so they gave up and failed. And then there were others, he said also, that uh, fell uh, among thorns and it was the deceit of riches and other things that choked them out. Jesus was referring to this over in Mark, the 8th chapter, in verse 36, when he said, what shall, a man, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It'll never happen to me. But Jesus said, what would you give in exchange for your soul? That's a penetrating question. In the parable of the sower, he said deceit caused them to turn back. He said that tribulations caused them to turn back. But my friend, it can be things other than just deceit and money and tribulations. I had a man tell me one time, he said, and he knew that God did not approve of what he was doing. And he said, I want to be happy. This makes me happy. God wants me to be happy. And he will understand. That's not going to happen. God wants you to be happy. That's true. But God wants you to obey him regardless of what you might want to exchange for your soul. What do we do about our failures? What do we do when we say it's not going to happen to me and it happens to us? We put our trust in God. We believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. We repent of that failure we confess to the world publicly that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. But as a Christian, we fail also. Peter did, and he was an apostle. And when that happens, James says, we must confess our faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And I guess the question today, the challenge today is if you're not a Christian and if you fail, there is no one to turn to but Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you are a Christian and disobey God and fall, fall uh, failing to repent and confess that sin, Peter says you are worse off than you were in the beginning. That, you know, that verse intrigues me. That if you obey the gospel, if you turn back, your condition is worse than it was before. And you think about that for a moment. If you're not a Christian, you're lost. But if you're a Christian and you fail and you do not change your life or repent, it says you're worse off than you were before. How can you be worse off than you were before when you were lost? 
that tells me that you're in a bad way if you as a Christian turn back to the world. If you, like Peter, say, that'll never happen to me. Be careful, because that which was, will never happen has happened many, many times. If you need to do something about your soul today, we invite you to do it today. Don't say it'll never happen to me, because it certainly can and will. You need to come. Won't you do it now as we stand together and as we sing?